Hi everyone, on this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at the Katna graph, what makes end tidal CO2 different from arterial CO2, how the machine works, and how to interpret the tracing. In a later video, we'll explore how to interpret some common changes in the Katna graph, what they mean, and what we can do about it in the operating room. So as we should all know, the Katna graph is an important monitor used to measure our patient's end tidal CO2, commonly denoted ETCO2. We monitor CO2 as various levels have various physiologic effects, which can have major effects on our patients, including cerebral ischemia, blunting of a patient's respiratory drive, hemodynamic instability, and acidosis, and much more. These topics will be discussed in another video later on, but as an introduction, knowing our CO2 is valuable in the world of anesthesia. A normal arterial CO2, denoted as PaCO2, we should all know at this point, is about 38 to 42 millimeters of mercury, give or take, for a normal individual. So if that's a normal PaCO2, then what's a normal end tidal CO2 and why? Well, a normal end tidal CO2 in a normal healthy patient is about 5 millimeters of mercury less than the arterial CO2. So about 33 to 37 millimeters of mercury. And we'll explain why they're different in a moment. So first, before we even look at the tracing, we need to get a general idea of how the technology works. And if you watch the video on the pulse oximeter, the concept is the exact same. There is a light emission source on one side. We'll call this emission. And on the other side, there is a light detection source. Infrared light is sent across at 4.25 micrometers. And this is the same wavelength that interacts with and is absorbed by our CO2 molecules. So as a gas sample, sample enters the monitor, various amounts of light from the emission source will reach the detection point based off of the amount of CO2 inside. As a result, the detector outputs a signal that is proportional to the amount of CO2 present in the sampling chamber as a function of the amount of light that reaches the light detector, i.e. the more CO2 present, the less infrared light that gets through to the sensor, the higher the output. The less CO2, the more light that gets through to the detector, the lower the sensor output. So now onto the graph tracing. So let's just get rid of some of this. And I promise my drawing of the lungs and everything will come in handy in a minute. So we're going to go ahead and draw one of our tracings. I apologize, I'm not an artist. And I'm going to go ahead and label it sections A, B, C, and D. And we're just going to talk about what's happening at each of these sections. So part A represents the start of exhalation. Start of exhalation. When we exhale, the first sample of air that becomes mobilized and that is seen by the CO2 sensor is the air closest to the sensor, which translates to it's the first air the sensor sees will be air that's here in the larynx and the rest of the trachea and the main stem bronchi and all parts of the airway that we know as dead space. Dead space are portions of the lung that do not undergo gas exchange. There's no alveoli there. But I encourage you to take a look at the VQ video for further exploration of the concept. Room air at baseline only contains trace amounts of CO2 while exhaled air can contain 4 to 5 percent CO2. As a result, all of the air in these blue circled spaces, these dead spaces, should have almost no CO2 in them at all as they did not undergo gas exchange and therefore the sensor will initially, as exhalation begins, read the CO2 as zero. Hence why the beginning of exhalation is this kind of flat line at zero. I apologize, I should also write in here that this would be 40 and this would be zero 
for CO2, CO2 millimeters of mercury. Now, like we mentioned before, the end tidal CO2 is actually about five less than the arterial CO2, and it's for the same reason here. When we exhale, the air in the alveoli that underwent gas exchange contains CO2, and it's then mixed with air in the dead space that contains no CO2. As a result, the percentage of carbon dioxide that is seen in the sensor is diluted, resulting in a slightly lower CO2 reading as the end tidal than the actual arterial CO2. Again, this is in a normal patient with normal physiology, and this does differ when we encounter pathology, such as COPD, that will be explained in later videos. Section B of the tracing represents when air from the alveoli is finally mobilized up through the airway and reaches the sensor, resulting in our steep upswing. So alveolar air reaches sensor. Section C represents the alveolar alveolar, sorry for my spelling, plateau. And this is the point at which the last of the alveolar CO2 is being seen by the sensor. So this is where it actually measures your end tidal CO2. Now between sections B and C, there's this angle here called the alpha angle. And the alpha angle represents VQ matching. In a normal patient, the angle will be 90 degrees. But in patients with VQ mismatches, it will actually be greater than 90 degrees, as you'll see in patients with COPD and asthma exacerbations. Again, that will be explored in a later video. Next, we have part D, which has our inspiratory downstroke. As a patient inspires, there should be a rapid drop in CO2 to baseline, as no more carbon dioxide is being expelled into the sampling site, but rather being sucked back into the lungs, or pushed back in if you're on a ventilator. Now, between sections C and D, of course, there is another angle, and this is called the beta angle. Just like the alpha angle, it should be 90 degrees. But if it's greater than 90 degrees, it represents rebreathing of CO2. And you can see this in pathologies such as laryngospasm or airway obstruction. This tracing should then continue in a normal cyclic pattern, as you've all seen in the operating room by this time. So that's all for the basics of the capnograph. Further videos will discuss pathologies, what they look like, and what we can do about them. As always, if you have any questions or topics you would like covered, please contact us. Otherwise, check in for our next video.